Welcome. Welcome, Mutembe. It's really nice to meet you. Thank you. It's yeah. a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Um, I've always wanted to meet you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're actually a celebrity. No, at no. least on LinkedIn. <laughs> oh, on LinkedIn. <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, you have to create a persona. And yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. So, uh, welcome to the Vilgro Africa Investments for Impact podcast. And this season, we're talking about artificial intelligence, which is why we have you over. And just to get us started, maybe you can just define AI. What is AI? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, just for everyone, I'm not an AI. So, just, <laughs> just for us to have that clear, that's why I'm not here. But I would say, Human beings have always been working on building tools that make their lives more efficient. And AI is a progression of, you know, millions, thousands of years of us doing that. Uh, you know, here in Kenya, we have prehistoric sites like Olorgesaile, where you can go and you can find 800,000 year old sites where you have Flintstones, right? When we started taking stones and making flints and using that for scrapping meat off of bones, for you know, pottery, for different things, right? So you can think of AI as a progression of that. So we took some of you know before we would use our hands and we made something artificial now that we could use to make things more efficient. Yeah. You know, you can say the Gutenberg um, print. print press, right, is mm -hmm. a way that we were able to take our thoughts in our heads and now communicate it to millions of people by building something that could be able to do that. So it was artificial. So in a, in a sense, the first books were almost artificial brains or, you know, conversations that we were able to put and other people could do. I like and that. And so, yeah, and yeah. AI today is a progression of us being able to harness, you know, electricity, you know, um, zeros and ones, you know, um, um, chips, uh, where you're now, you know, the the gates where you're able to put an electric current goes opens and closes zeros and ones, and we're able to store information there. And the same way we were able to create the printing press, now this has become our new way of putting our thoughts and the way we think, and you know, it's a way to more efficiently build a tool that can help us in in our lives in you know processing information. The same way now today. AI becomes being able to take care of a lot of really boring tasks, for example, like identifying, you know, an, an image, right? If it's image recognition, if it's being able to recognize a human voice, right? You know, so that you can now scale it. If you are only one person, you could not translate all the news in the world, right? Yeah. But now, you know, I think recently you saw Larry Mado being able to speak in Chinese and English at the same time. Yeah. So that's, you know, we've been able to use those zeros and ones, those, you know, semiconductor chips, and then being able to now translate. If we had people to translate what he was saying in real time, you know, to millions of millions of people, it would have taken us a lot of work, right? So I'd say AI is literally now trying to get machines to help us in terms of being able to do the same things that humans could do. And so that we can take care of a lot of our manual tasks, like repetitive works, like you know, if you've worked in a bank, the back office, if you're a teacher, you know, you've been spending so much time marking papers of like hundreds of students, yeah. you know, how do you reduce that uh, backlog? If you're a doctor, after every patient, you have to write down all that report. How do we use now, you know, um, um, automatic speech recognition to be able to do speech to text, you know, for you to be able to reduce the time that a doctor spends. So I'd say artificial intelligence is now the whole general area of trying to get machines to do things and tasks that humans would do. And it's a general term that now talks about all the techniques we use to, to get to achieve that. There's something called machine learning. You can just take it machine learning. The same way you have a small child or even you yourself, you need to take a book and read and you see pictures with labels. The same way a, a child is taught, that's the same way machine learning works, where you give a lot of examples of something to a machine and the next time it is able to encounter that uh, word or that image or that sound, then it can recognize it. And then it can also be able to aggregate that and be able to predict in the future. So. And then there's deep learning, there's reinforcement learning. Now, these are other techniques in there. Um, so you can say it's 
it's a lot of mathematics. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of statistics in there. It's a lot of calculus, linear algebra. If you remember being a, being asked to, you know, what is X or A plus B equals C, you know, that yeah. it's a lot of that now inputting different data sets and then now using software and programming to automate a lot of the processes and then using a lot, a lot of data from all around the world to now so that you can give as many examples of something as possible and then can be able to make decisions. So that's a short. Wow. Yeah. Not very short, but, <laughs> but quite comprehensive. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So what I hear you saying is that AI is a tool for making life more efficient yes. in simple terms, yes. but uh, deploying all the technologies that we've had from the past uh, to basically uh, take away some of the menial tasks that we would have to do that we find boring, but having machines do that for us. Yeah, or dangerous tasks. Uh -huh. and, yeah, like now you can use machines to go into mines to rescue mine workers, right? You can use... You can have sensors can, that can be able to detect methane inside a mine so that you can stop an explosion and, and collapse. You know? yeah. So there's so many ways that um, you know, AI is, is helping us. Wonderful. Now, within that context, uh, maybe we can talk about your company, Fastaga. Maybe you could tell us what Fastaga does. So Fastaga is an AI company mm -hmm. and we're focused on building um, secure, connectivity independent AI. Mm -hmm. So we build infrastructure that uh, or software tools that can be able to help people run machine learning and AI uh, applications on low power, low connectivity devices. One of the biggest problems we came across when we were trying to deploy machine learning and AI solutions is the fact that about a third of the world, this is about 2.6 billion people have never used the internet. So yeah. there's a very big digital divide. Now, if you bring in AI, and even, for example, that one that everybody has been engaging with is the chatbot, you know, um, you know, uh, by OpenAI, ChatGPT is you usually need pretty good internet to be able to use that and get the advantages of ChatGPT. Now, imagine those people who've never used internet or those people who don't have consistent uh, connectivity. And for us, we, we realize that there is a lot of need for a platform where people can come and you know, build machine learning that can be used on low end phones or, you know, that are not always connected to the Internet. And so we decided that's what we're going to focus on because we came to those challenges when we were trying to build some of our own solutions and nobody was building that for us. So we decided let's build it. Thanks. I like that. So you are trying to, through your company, avoid a situation where AI expands the digital divide. Yes. Brilliant. I like that. Thanks. Yeah. So um, how did you get into AI? According to LinkedIn, you studied <laughs> econometrics and qualitative economics. Yeah. That's quite a long way off from AI. Maybe you could tell us a bit about how you ended up here. So the interesting thing is that that's when you start realizing that machine learning AI is something that has existed. It's, it's data. So mm -hmm. econometrics is perfect, mm -hmm. right, for understanding. You're doing a lot of regressions, linear algebra. So that's actually a perfect um, background mm -hmm. to it. And then now you add software. Because now in my grad school, I actually did now information systems and software engineering. And so brought the two together, like an understanding of data and now of software. But my first, you know, push to AI actually happened um, a, a longer time ago. So um, I was about 12 years old and this is the time when a lot of computers were being thrown away by companies because Moore's law was working really well yeah and so one of these companies was throwing out, out a com an old computer compact computer and you know um, my, my dad managed to salvage it and when we got it home and i was just playing with it and engaging with it and i find this one program it was in sort of a, a, do um, a dos uh, format and you know, I switch it on, and I'm engaging in this text dialogue. And immediately, I switch it on. I hear, I, I see script written on the screen of, "Hello, how are you? My name is Eliza. Mm -hmm. What's your name?" And then I put my name. "Hello, my name is Mtembe." And then it's like, "Oh, nice to meet you, Mtembe. Uh, how are you feeling today?" And you know, it was really surprised to me to see like this sort of 
uh, a program almost as another person in a machine. Yeah. And, you know, later on I engaged with it and I realized, oh, okay, there's a way you can program machines to almost engage like humans yeah. um, in, in a chat. And that's what really got me interested in really understanding, like, what is, like, you know, machine learning. Yeah, and this, so eventually I learned that this was ELISA, which was the first chatbot, which was built in around the 1960s at MIT. And, you know, I really now started getting into the rabbit hole of, like, oh, I really want to learn tech and understand what tech is all about. And later on, what happened is that uh, I now entered a world of like uh, engaging with human rights and, you know, realized that some of my roommates or conference people, you know, people who went to the conference with people were people who had been child soldiers, who had gone through a lot of um, challenges in life. And I realized, okay, let me, I can't do tech for tech's sake because yeah. the world is a lot more complicated. I need to do more with tech. And so then I, you know, thought about how do you use tech to, you know, change people's lives and make, make lives better. And so now that's the trajectory that has led to now working in multiple countries, uh, eventually now to build Fastega because the realization was that, you know, Africa right now, 2% of the world's GDP, 3%, there's so much more that we can contribute to the world, yeah. especially in the space of AI, because we have our data now. And the idea of even fast tag, if you look at the name, it's fast tagging. So we need to train machines on African data really fast to catch up and really democratize AI. And so now that became the vision that really pushed, you know, the, the focus on building fast tagger. So how can we really build AI and, and catch up and connect with the rest of the world and solve a lot of the problems a lot faster than we could have? We don't have enough doctors. We don't have enough teachers. Mm -hmm. How can we you know, leverage AI to solve these problems. We have, you know, challenges with, you know, climate change. How can we use AI to be able to, you know, do climate financing, more resilient, you know, plants, you know, uh, in, uh, and so how can AI help us in that? And so that's why we, we set up Fast Tiger. Wow, I, I really like that. I'm inspired. So your first interaction was with Eliza. Yeah. I didn't actually know there were chatbots back in the, in the 60s. So we tend to think that AI is new, but it sounds like you're saying that AI has been with us for quite a while. For quite a while. I mean, the idea of having intelligent machines to help humans has, gone, has been there for the longest time, I think, in, in human history. Yeah. And we've always been thinking, you know, how do we build... Uh, machines that can help us from even the pulleys that we you know built mm -hmm. and all these things uh, that, that we were building until today you know it's always been an idea and so if you think about uh, mechanical tags you know Amazon has you know mechanical tags but mm -hmm. the mechanical tag idea of like you know all these machines that could play chess with people or could yes. do different things you know those are things that are going on like you know hundreds of years ago right mm -hmm. and then you know today I think the the first conference you could say that was around yeah I was in I think that in Dartmouth in the US uh, in the 1950s yeah uh, Minsky and his his crew of like um, intellectuals and then since then, there have been a lot of AI winters and, you know, times such as this where it's, you know, it's a time where it's, it's, it's really booming. A lot of people, even when we started, were like, okay, what are you doing? What, yes. is, what is AI? You know, yeah. we, we, we were shut down by quite a lot of um, investors and people telling us that it's, it doesn't make any sense. But then now we're starting to see, of course, it's moving slowly. It has its challenges. But yes, it's always been part of, we've been using it day to day without knowing it, right? If someone has ever gotten a Fuliza loan, there's been some machine learning in the back end to yes. do credit scoring. If you've ever ordered food and it's been delivered on any of the apps, matching algorithms, mm -hmm. you've also used, if you've ever watched a YouTube video, if you've ever watched a TikTok video, you know, the, if you've ever had noise cancelling earphones, you know, literally it's all over. All of that is AI. Yeah, all that is some version of AI. Okay. So now if we could go a bit into the misconceptions and the controversies. Last year, um, the so-called godfather of AI resigned from Google yeah. and was very concerned about the direction that things were taking. I think uh, there was a comment about how the the progression of ai is becoming scary yeah. 
mm-hmm. and I think Elon Musk and some some other folks even signed a sort of a petition to slow down the development of AI. Now, uh, if you could speak a bit in, into that, are the fears around AI taking over unfounded fears, or or is there a good basis for such fears? What's your opinion? Yeah. I think uh, I've recently been uh, reading a book by Mustafa, who's one of the founders of Google DeepMind, and so Google DeepMind is this company that you know Dennis Hassab is like. You know, built things such as AlphaGo, AlphaFold, which has discovered over 200 different, you know, protein structures that has led to us being able to build enzymes that can break down, you know, pro, uh, you know, uh, plastics and, mm-hmm. you know, enzymes that can help to, you know, stop the spread of malaria. The, the, and so there are founded fears of what could be done. The same way when we built, when we were able to harness fire. There's a lot of things that we can do with fire, both good and bad, you know. Um, we were able to warm things and we were able to now, you know, be able to to digest food better, like once you've cooked it and get those proteins and our stomachs didn't have to work so hard so that our brains now could actually use some of that energy to grow. Right? Mm-hmm. Now, the similar with any technology, there's the good and the bad. And now we've been able to, so far, in a lot of ways, been able to contain fire. We've, you know... And so now that's the question that people are having. How can we also have, you know, containment also in AI, right? And so the question is is around, is, is are there fears that, oh, you know, it's going to take over? Usually a lot of people make jokes. This um, A lot of people say, you know, it's going to take over, but then for a long time it couldn't tell what is the face of a puppy and what is a muffin <laughs> in a picture, yeah. right? Or today you can see all the jokes right now about um, uh, Google Gemini uh, making its mistakes. Uh, but then they also founded fears of misinformation, for yes. example, right? So now it's all about how do we contain a technology? You know, nuclear gave us clean energy, uh, but it also gave us challenges, right? So with the technology such as artificial intelligence, and a lot of times when people talk about artificial intelligence, we are talking about the numerous, you know, machine learning tools that have been developed that are making life, optimizing things, making things so much easier to do. Um, and, and, and on the other side, there is this artificial general intelligence. So that's a lot of the conversation that's going on if you're talking about open AI, and I believe that's what uh, Professor Geoff like, um, you know, w- was talking about in terms of some of the risks. And so the reality is that there are challenges that could come, but there's also a lot of opportunity, especially for places such as, you know, emerging markets such as Africa, where there's so, ma- so many gaps we need to overcome yes. in infrastructure, in training, you know, talent and such like, like that. So I would say there's the, the it's all about how do we contain the people who could use ai in, in the wrong way and especially when you talk about ai that is like the artificial general intelligence that's like strong ai because there's weak ai strong ai you know and it could do a lot of things it could be able to predict entire stock markets uh, but it's not yet there right yes. because that's why we were talking about turin you know, this sort of the new Turing standard is is not whether it's able to convince another human being that it's 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 another human being because humans can be fooled very easily and mm-hmm. even very smart humans. But whether you can put out an AI and say, hey, here's a hundred thousand dollars, make ten million dollars um, after a few weeks on the stock market, then maybe that's you know you're going through uh, artificial general intelligence. But yeah, there are fears and there's also the opportunities. Okay, so um, maybe coming closer home, if you could speak to some local African AI tools that people use every day without probably even realizing it, yeah. what, what are some examples um, that, that we know of that we are interacting with every day? Yeah, so every, to, today I used a little cab to get here. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. there's some machine learning going on in the back end, like some matching algorithms to match me with that particular driver based of where I am, the location where I am, and connecting me to that. That's some basic machine learning. It's not mm-hmm. super AI, but it's basic, right? Um, you know, when when people are sharing with each other. So funny enough, 
um, over this weekend mm-hmm. when Mr. Benny Hinn uh, or Bishop, I think that's his name, Bishop yes. Benny Hinn was in town. Yeah, they used VR mm-hmm. in the mini in their ministry. They oh. also they also used uh, live translation um, software uh-huh. right, of, to to broadcast his sermon in multiple languages. Right, that is you know. Um, automatic speech recognition you know it's translation right so you know all these kenyans who went there um and to listen to 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 the word yeah they were listen, they were interacting with ai oh you know if if you've ever you know in kenya people have done fuliza loans they've done uh tala or, or branch or all this on the back end you know they've actually been doing a bit of machine learning to you know assess your credit score if you've gone to a bank and you know you, you've you've loaned gotten money and such and they've done some risk with you they've used some bit of machine learning if you've ever watched a youtube video if you've ever gone and searched on google mm-hmm. uh, for something you know if you've used facebook so these are all ways we've been interacting in the world with there which have, have made our work easier so imagine if you had to go through all the different websites in the world to figure out how to, you know, get yourself a, a pair of shoes or a dress, mm-hmm. right? But now they've used some machine learning on the back end and they've been able to present you with exactly a shop that's probably near you at and, and it's in Kenya shilling, currency converters. You know, it's in Kenya shillings and it's not in dollars. And, and the things like you can predict, you can use Google Maps. So the border border riders, right, who are using the apps, yeah, they are using part of machine learning because Google Maps is using a lot of machine learning and now it's using also a lot of AI. And of course, all the people who've been using ChatGPT have also been using um, AI. So it's literally embedded. And even the Mamamboga, to an extent, yeah. you know, she's out there, she's selling you know, her, her, her goods. But on the other side, right, there's been some scientists who have been trying to build more crop-resistant crops that have enabled her to... You know, you you know, sell that particular crop at maybe off season, yes. right? So the you know, people are interacting with the AI almost every day. Even the phone call you're making, right? So that you know, the towers and for 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 you know the um, the, the 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 telecom companies to be able to manage like the load on the network, right? They are using some some machine learning as well. So when you are talking to people on the phone and uh, these always, if you've been on Zoom. And Zoom is able to, you know, uh, reduce the noise in the room. They are also using a bit of machine learning there. Um, or if you've used one of these, you know, tools to be able to summarize um, note taking. Yes. Using yeah. So it's literally in every every part of our lives, okay. and making it better. Yeah. So thank you for for demystifying AI. So AI is not just coming. AI has been here, and we're using AI every day in our day-to-day lives. Yeah. Uh, but AI has some risks, just like every other technology, and we can we can manage those risks. So my next question is around um, employment. There's also been a lot of concerns around people losing jobs as a result of AI, and particularly in, in Africa, in countries such as ours, where... Unemployment is a huge issue. So the idea that AI will take away even what we might call menial tasks means potentially that some people will lose employment. Uh, Of course, there are opportunities, but maybe if you could speak to that a bit and share your perspective on what AI will do in the job market. Yeah, so the future of work is here. In a sense, like a lot of people are talking about the future of work, yes. how the future uh, will look like. Now, I usually like mentioning, for example, you know, a lot of people will talk about, oh, you know, there are people who were blacksmiths and, you know, making horseshoes and then when the automobile came, they, they <laughs> looked those jobs. Yeah. But they, are, they were able to transfer their skills maybe to the factory yes. uh, floor. But I also, you know, think about, you know, back in the day when, you know, whiteout. I don't know if anyone remembers whiteout. Eh? 
So, you know, when you had typewriters, mm -hmm. you know, you needed to know how a skill to really nicely put that white out eh, over that, you know, uh, text. To erase. Written, to erase. Text, yeah. And so I think as technology goes, right, it always creates new opportunities where the, the one of the biggest industries in the world uh, used to be whale hunting. So mm -hmm. we used to hunt whales so that we can take the blab and then we can use it for, for lanterns, yes. right? And then when electricity was, 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 was invented, uh, Tesla, you know, worked on electricity. And once it was distributed, at least hopefully we have more whales in the world, right? So, you know, they, they can be both good and bad. So all those people who used to be on those whaling ships, Right, you know, they had to find, they had to reskill, and that's the beauty about human beings. We can reskill. If you're from a previous generation in, in Kenya, yeah. you remember packages. You know, where after high school you went to go and learn how to use, but to do yes, packages, computer packages, yeah, computer <laughs> MS Word, uh, you know, PowerPoint, and all these things. Right yeah. now, has it created less jobs or more jobs? I would say there are categories, right, of, of jobs that. Um, were no longer required, but then created a whole host of jobs. YouTube crea creators, eh? you know, would never have existed if it wasn't for some machine learning algorithms that are able to connect an advertiser or, you know, so that algorithm for, for, for YouTube can work and then you can get paid and then, of course, now you're taxed as well. But, you know, <laughs> the idea is that the shifts in the economy create also opportunities. And so the question is, um, and I remember there is a Dr. Shiko from uh, Kala, she keeps on saying that um, it's not that you, they are going, you, you're going to lose your jobs, but you're going to lose your job to the person who can leverage AI. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you're just going to lose your job, no. But someone else is going to get it because mm -hmm. they can leverage AI. So, for example, I've been talking to, you know, Dr. Raktors, like at University of Nairobi, to... Um, women entrepreneurs, uh, digital entrepreneurs, and, 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 and other entrepreneurs and, and telling them how they can actually leverage their technology for, you know, people have been talking about creatives, right? And losing some of their jobs because we've seen Safaricom and other companies put these ads. Yes. The interesting thing about um, AI is like, especially these large language models which are able to generate image, text, sound, uh, pictures, is that if you're not a, like a really good at your particular craft and you know the you know nomenclature in your particular task, then you, you cannot prompt it in the right way, mm -hmm. right? Now, by saying that, oh, nobody will need creatives or copywriters anymore, but someone might actually not be a good at writing at all or at creating art at all or being a good tailor or a photographer. And then, you know, someone who's really good at that knows that language and can use that language to do their work more efficiently. I was talking to someone who does photography and video editing um, recently, and they say they're actually now able to make more money because now they can do work for more clients because it used to take them weeks sometimes to do editing um, after they've gone for an event, a corporate event, or yes. they've recorded something to do the editing. Now they do it in an hour. Well, the, 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 the client gets their work faster. And in fact, you, pay, you make them pay more because they're like, ah, you know, I had to speed up this work for you and things like that. But, you know, you're now able to get more clients. So the idea is that, yes, there'll be a need for people to upskill. Mm -hmm. and there will be some categories um, of work that will no longer uh, need to be done. Mm -hmm. That also frees, frees time um, to be able to get other skills and to, to do actually be more productive and make more money in your business. That's how I look at it. Yeah. Now, maybe you could speak particularly to low-skill jobs and the kind of jobs that lower-income people do because, you know, one of the concerns is around increasing inequality. And, and you said rightly that you don't just lose your job, someone else gains your job. So are there opportunities for people with lower levels of education uh, within AI? Absolutely. So for example, right now, you don't need to spend four years, you know, learning computer science and then another, you know, couple of years as a junior developer and then to be able to build things. Now, there are a lot of no-code or low-code tools. You can literally go onto... Uh, you know, Google Bard or ChatGPT, 
and be able to say, okay, write for me code for this kind of a website or this kind of an app. Mm -hmm. You have the idea, right? You might not have the skill to build something, but now all this AI, you know, um, Jensen Huang, who's like the CEO of NVIDIA, which, you know, right now it's the hottest company because everybody is trying to build to build AI. So they need the, you know, they say in a gold rush, sell the the, the shovels, right? Yeah. And he's selling the shovel, shovels in terms of like the, uh, what you call GPUs. Yes. Um, which are, and then, so he said that their, his job at, uh, and, and the company's job right now is to build the best AI that can do programming. Your job is to be very good at a specific domain and now be able, so like if you're a carpenter, you can, they, ideally now you should be able to use AI to go and say, hey, you know, um, please draw for me like a lot of uh, unique, you know, um, furniture of this style and this style, because you have the experience as a carpenter, yeah. right? You, you know what your customers want and then you ask it to design for you and you're like, okay, fine. Then tell me step by step how you'd be able to source these materials and be able to make it and, and give me a sales strategy. You know, I recently finished a, a workshop with um, a women MSMEs and gig workers and, you know, saying how they can, from coming up with a business plan all the way to coming up with a, a promotional video, promotional content, to a, biz, a business proposal, to a presentation for a customer. They can do all that in under two hours with AI and they can go and sell their services. So even people who we are saying, you know, probably are not uh, the most skills in white collar jobs. In fact, white collar jobs are the ones actually which are most at risk. That's the interesting thing. You know, plumbers, carpenters, you know, electricians. These are actually people who demand is going to actually be for them, right? So a white collar are the ones who actually, you know, the ones who need to upskill themselves and learn how to use um, AI tools. The interesting thing is that, you know, the things such as care, elderly care or, you know, nursing, all the things are things, therapy, you know, all these are skills that are going to continue being needed and actually there's going to be even more demand for them, right? Um, you know, people such as, as VR assistants, um, virtual reality assistants or like um, digital experience experts. It's the same way 20 years ago if you told your parent that I'm going to become, uh, a, a, you know, an Instagram social media uh, manager or, or something like that, you know, they would have been like, what is that? <laughs> right? But now even yeah. that social media person can use, you know, AI to generate, you know, uh, content that, you know, can, that is, is SEO efficient and, you know, can automate even uh, things. So I'd say that the people who we are seeing actually that uh, don't have the skill, now they can actually they don't have to spend years to learn that skill. They can leverage now AI to help them in their carpentry business, electrician business, you know, coming up with their business plans, their promotional materials, and how to do their sales calls, go to market. There's now opportunity for them as well. Wow, thank you. Now, you kind of have set us up for the next question, which is around the ethics of AI, which is, which is a topic of growing importance right now. So, in your opinion, what are some of the ways in which developers and users can address questions of ethics in AI? Yeah. And this is the interesting opportunity now as well. Because, for example, another job opportunity now that is coming up is AI ethicists. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, responsible AI lawyers, privacy lawyers, you know. Um, you know, te technicians who can be able to make sure that uh, tools are private. Even for us as a company, yeah. the opportunity has come up building more secure, you know, um, uh, AI mm -hmm. and, and models that can work on device, not sharing your information with anybody else, right? Mm -hmm. So there's actually now a big opportunity because it's humans who decide what the ethics are. It's like a society in their context who decide what's ethical and how you can now use AI, right? How to properly contain it from misuse. So, and I think this is a really, really important thing, right? There's been a lot of conversation about responsible, you know, AI. The, yes. I mean, with Bletchley Park, there was that big conference, you know, in the UK that happened about AI ethics. Mm -hmm. You know, there's um, the within the EU in Brussels, they came up with like the AI Act, um, you know, borrowing heavily from Japan where they came up with like the color codes for the different risk 
factors in AI. You know, you look at the U.S. with the you know uh, presidential, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, what, what do they call it? Uh, so the you know President Biden put out a mandate about like how AI, you know, um, safety and the committees to come around how it should safely be used. So in here in Kenya, we have the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. We're having conversations around, you know, having an, a national AI strategy, which you know, I think that needs to be our first step. Yes. So I think it's extremely important to come up with good, you know, risk uh, management uh, frameworks. So for example, there's one called by the by the U.S. Department of Commerce, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which has come up with a very, you know, unique. Um, risk framework and all this is being done also and, and i believe in the uk now has now done a lot of work of how do we approach ai um looking at it as an opportunity and mitigating the risks right so because it's a huge opportunity and i think even for us and i think it's always about the cultures because right now whenever we hear about a lot of these conversations we are hearing about it on the side of let's say you know um, the us or yes. other markets we need to also come up with the this ethics based of our own you know um, cultures and what it is that we you know is permissible for us because ai to a large extent is your culture going into a machine and to be able to be helping you because you're literally creating a helper right yes. in a sense and so i think what we need to be very com uh, cautious of just cognizant of the fact that whenever someone you know tells you look this is responsible this is not you should also look at it as like oh what does my culture usually say like what is okay what is not okay among my culture are, are we more uh, collective people community different people than individual people so will be something that uh, works best for the community rather than individual be what is ethical for us as africans versus you know an, another country so that's also something we need to think about when you're thinking about um, ethics uh, but it, it's it's a it's it's definitely a, a big thing that you know we should put it and it's not only about AI. It should be about everything. Our politics. It should be about, you know, bio, you know, bioethics. It's it goes into so many things. And because AI is going to touch so many things of our lives, it really needs to be integrated into policy. Um, Mozilla does a lot of work also around this. Um, so yeah. So I think it's it's something that we need to also make our own choices and not just wait for someone else to come and tell us what is ethical and what is not. I like that. So traditionally. Um, in Africa, we've been consumers of technology, but what I hear you saying and the opportunity I see is that we, in this new wave of technology development, of AI technology development, can make sure that our, our cultures and our ways of life are represented in the way technology is built. And and in the process, uh, we can create jobs for ethicists. <laughs> yeah. So um, m moving on to the question of data, if you could briefly discuss the role of data in AI uh, and also touch on data quality and privacy, particularly in the African context. I know earlier we were talking about how Africa is not really well covered. So if, if, if in, in terms of uh, our data being applied in AI technologies, if, if you could discuss that briefly. Yeah. I think you cannot talk about AI without talking about data. Sure. Right? And talking about lots of data, petabytes, mm -hmm. um, zettabytes of mm -hmm. data. Now, the reality is that whenever people you know, talk about AI, especially in the African context, the truth is we haven't built AI. <laughs> That's the reality. We keep, you know, you have some people out there saying that, oh, we need to regulate, but what are we regulating? Yes. We actually need to build. We actually need to promote, you know, government needs to come up with incentives to increase research and to, you know, put more data centers using our geothermal power so we can have green AI. And so when we're talking about data, you know, 
one of the things that's happening right now in the world, and I think Mozilla actually did a, a report and, and found that in the crawler, you know, which used to be, it's this company that now goes and crawls the entire internet. And then that's what a lot of these big tech companies have been using to build these large language models, which is what a lot of people are talking as AI right now. Mm -hmm. um, these really large uh, chatbots. And you realize that when it comes to Africa, there's a new scramble for Africa, but it's a scramble for African data, African medical data, African language data. We have over 2,000 languages, right? And most of the time when you leave urban centers, people are speaking in their vernacular. That's what they understand the most, right? Yes. Um, you know, I think someone said, like, you know, if, if you want to talk to, to speak to a person, you know, you speak maybe in a language they understand, but if you want to connect to their heart, you speak it to them in their language, right? Yes. So right now, you know, that's also a big, you know, in 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 Doluo, in Luya, in Kisi, in, you know, Amharic, in Hausa, in, you know, Zulu, you know, there's still so much that has, you know, of, of language um, sets in Africa that actually haven't been, you know, um, collected and, you know, put in a way that we can actually train machines um, to do, to, to use and to communicate to us for things like in healthcare, in, 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 in maternal healthcare and, and so many use cases. So I believe right now, I think one of the big impetuses for us to, to build Fastaga was because in 20, I think 2018 or 19 Davos, um, Yuval Harari, the author of, um, of the Sapiens books, said something very interesting. He said that the, in the future that he sees, like if we don't rectify our course, is there'll be AI superpowers and data colonies. And right now, as we're talking, we haven't built robust AI in Africa yet. There's efforts which are being done by people such as Masakane NLP, which is a group of people who are in the natural language processing space. You know, you have people, uh, Dr. Busi and, and others uh, in South Africa with the Lepa AI who are trying to build, you know, language data sets. You have Dr. Lillian here out of Maseno building the Kenya Corpus. You know, you have, you know, people like um, um, Simiu, Kathleen Simiu at Mozilla doing the uh, Mozilla Common Voice, Mark Irura at, you know, GIZ, the Lacuna Project, um, uh, and, and, and the thing, and Fair Forward. And so you have a lot of people in different countries trying to do uh, work. But if you think about it, there's a recent report um, by, you know, the Qubit Lab um, at Kala. And, you know, if you think about it, the money that was spent to fund Anthropic, which is an AI company last year, was mm -hmm. $4 billion. The money that was invested in all of African tech startups, all, now you were talking about agri, energy, across sectors, every, across sectors was about $3.8 billion. Right? So when we're talking about, you know, data and AI, um, you know, we are not even in the game. Yeah. We we're not doing anything almost, right? But there's a lot of efforts that, we are, that are being done, but there needs to be a lot. People need to wake up to the reality that, you know, if we don't catch up and don't build air, because it's very contextual, if we don't invest in the, you know, um, electricity, you know, building those data centers in the, in the internet infrastructure, in the toolkits that are able to deploy um, AI on devices that, you know, we have in Africa, which are low power, low connectivity, then, you know, even that 2% to the global, global GDP that we're contributing will be negligible, it will even be less, right? And so I think a lot needs to be done in engaging, you know, with government institutions to be able to have access to data, particularly for local innovators, and not just, you know, create the data sets and just sell them to the big tech, right? Uh, but then there needs to be a lot of cooperation between, um, you know, the, the different state uh, 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 parties. And so if you're talking about data, we're talking about voice data. So that's language. We're talking about text data, financial data from, you know, there's our banks have a lot of data. Uh, you're talking about, to be all, you know, health data, right? If we are going to be able to focus, a lot of the diseases we're having in Africa, they are not on the radar of a lot of like startups like abroad, right? Or companies abroad. So they'll be solving their problems and what's important for them will be left here. We still have like neglected tropical diseases. 
Yes, they're neglected for a reason because yes. we are not doing the research uh, or enough of the research. We are waiting for someone else to do the research to, to take care of them, right? Um, you look at like our road problems and, you know, water problems and climate change, what's happening. We need to build those solutions, you know, um, for, for ourselves, like more climate resistant, you know, um, uh, seeds, you know, for, for, for farmers to, to plant. You know, that needs to be research we are doing ourselves and machine learning and AI can really help. And that data is really important um, for us to, to use. And so I'd say to avoid becoming a data colony, yes. we need to invest in data infrastructure, collect it. satellite imagery. Um, we did a program as our startup with Airbus uh, at some point and the cost that was there in moving satellites over rural parts of Africa consistently over time, if you're doing for an agriculture use case, it's crazy because even, you know, like over Europe, like they, there's enough, you know, um, commercial viability that, that's happening there for, for people to demand that. But even we, we don't have enough of our own satellites, right? There's a few satellites that we've been putting up. So even for geospatial data, that's all, which can be used to do a lot, like figure out how to, you know, um, do climate fin um, insurance for our farmers, being able mm -hmm. to... Our plots are usually small, you know, maybe like a quarter of an acre up to five, right? You know, the algorithms that need to be able to detect those boundaries, you know, to be able to predict what yield is going to be done for food security. That's also something we need to do. We can't wait for people who, when you tell them five acres or a quarter of an acre, people are doing farming there, they're like, what is that? <laughs> you know, they are used to doing like, hundreds of thousands of acres. Yes. Yeah, so that data is really essential, just spatial, voice, um, text, you know, financial data, structured and unstructured data. We really need to collect a lot of this and label it. So, Mutembe, in your experience so far, have you come across problems that people expect could be solved by AI, but that are really not the type of problems AI can solve. Basically, what I'm asking is, what would you say are the limitations of AI? So AI is not a panacea. It's not to be stamped on every problem. Right? Yes. We there are a lot of so the, the, for a long time people are saying that even when you're in the you know political economy side of things, you know you can build roads for people, but whether they drive well on those roads and cause accidents, that's a different story. Yes. So in Kenya, all we do is like you add more bumps, right? Which is not solving the problem. It's the people who are supposed to, you know, drive. It's um, the software. Safer. It's the software. It's the people themselves, yeah. right? And so AI, the thing is also it inherits a lot of our biases. And that's the other thing, you know, um, there's a lady called Dr. Timit and, and, and she's been talking about this for a, a long time is that, you know, some of the existential fears that people usually have of AI taking over and everything, those are a bit far out. But the ones that are there today, like, you know, biases in some of these data sets, you know, being able, for example, they, there's an index that was being done, I think, by people at uh, Princeton and also others at, at, uh, at, at Stanford about, you know, if you look at, uh, and, and you notice, I'm not even talking about local institutions because we are not doing much, but yes. uh, when we need to do more. Uh, but the thing is, they realize that, for example, if you ask AI to give you recently, the image of an African daughter, uh, sorry, African doctor treating a European child, the AI was giving you a giraffe because it just, because of based on what it was trained on, it had no context <laughs> of, yeah. of, of, of a black doctor it yes. just, or, or, or a woman pilot. Or, you know, th these are the things that, uh, uh, you know, so for us to trust AI to, to do a lot of these things, um, the, the, the side of we need to learn about this, you know, biases that we need to fix um, in the AI, um, it reflects a lot of our own um, challenges. But of course, it's going to get better. Like if you looked at, you know, this image generation um, systems a year ago, they were horrible. Now they're like, whoa, yes. you know, like Sora from, from OpenAI. Now, the thing is of you, you can't just always, it's like using a hammer to kill a mosquito yes. you're probably going to hurt yourself especially if the mosquito is on you so we really need to look at problems and see okay do we really need ai for this so like a lot of times some clients would you know people would come to us um, who want some an ai solution 
and they're like, hey, you know, we need something to classify, you know, these images or, or this product to this price or like what's happening in this case. And then we're like, oh, well, you can just use, you know, basic Python or a shell script to solve that problem. You don't need to deploy, a, you know, a trainer model on like GPUs, which one GPU is like $30,000 or like even hours of using it is so expensive. So usually AI requires something that needs, you know, so much data uh, to be able to understand something like really, really complex. And that's why really the uses are becoming in, you know, things such as finding new chemical compounds, new proteins, things are very hard for, that are very hard for science. Um, that's where actually you, you need you need AI. Um, a lot of other things, it's us as humans actually needing to, you know, think and, 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 and come up with solutions around and then maybe augment um, with, with AI. And so I would say that, you know, a lot of problems like our social problems uh, in the world, those are things that we need to figure out fast, right? Uh, and then, you know, see, okay, how can we solve that? Um, there's a very good example. I mean, I, I, I've worked in development previously, and um, there's this one thing that um, a Japanese agency was trying to help with. And so they would go and they had this, you know, it's a wash program, water and sanitation and health. And so they're like, oh, people are getting a lot of cholera in, in this particular area or like diarrhea, stomach diseases, right? And so they said, okay, fine. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's put signs for them to wash their hands in the toilets. Then, because you know, the Japanese are very, also very interesting. I, I love the way Japan culture is always about user um, human-centered design. So they said, okay, fine. What we're going to do for this project is we're just going to send someone to do the whole process themselves, go to that place, um, go to the toilet that place and then, you know, uh, figure out and then just have the experience, pass the experience, user experience. So the person goes and then, yes, there's a sign there, but they go to open the tap, there's no water. So your, your solution was a big campaign about washing hands, but there's no water. Yes. Right. So that's the same way we need to think about some of these things when we are thinking always about deploying AI um, to solve a certain problem. We have to like really look at our process and say, you know, if you're a corporate, right, is it that, you know, people don't trust each other in the organization and there's such a hierarchy in the organization that to do, to send an email, you need to get five signatures and nobody wants to take ownership. You know, you might automate the whole thing, but still everybody has to give approvals. So it's automated, but people have to approve and people will be unhappy that this was done. So the idea is like we need to really have a very human centered um, way of looking at the problems and even how to apply AI, because AI is only going to be as good as the, 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 the process and the thought process that humans are taking to actually solve that particular problem. Yeah. Thank you. You know, I laughed earlier because you reminded me of a meme I saw last week of uh, an AI generated image. I don't know if you've seen it of Martha Teresa fighting poverty. Have you seen that one? No, I haven't seen that one. So it, it has Martha Teresa on the one hand in a martial arts pose and African children, you know, uh, on the other side <laughs> also in martial arts poses fighting each other. So just goes to say what yeah. you're talking about, yeah. that AI will <laughs> extend our biases. The biases. Yeah. So you can pretty much tell who, which guys developed that system. <laughs> They're probably yeah. not guys here. Yes. And, and people were commenting on that and saying, ooh, like Mother Teresa, you had to go for black children. Yeah. yeah. So as we close, uh, Mutembe, AI is obviously a huge opportunity. And uh, if you could project for us a few years to come, what, what do you see as the possibilities for us uh, as Africans? And what do you think we need to do to not become the data colonies um, you were talking about earlier? And if you could speak to different actors, whether government or developers, startups, investors, what would your message be? I think 
overall, what I'd say is there's no AI without data. And right now, I think a lot of the things that people are doing here is mostly just software. Um, it's if else statements. It's the basic way you do software. We need the data. If we don't have data, then we're actually not building AI. So I need. I think one of the most important things I think for Kenya, we need to you know follow the trend of even Rwanda, where we need to come up with a robust national AI strategy of how we're actually going to harness AI, and we need to move away from the push towards you know uh, punitive you know laws um, trying to stop. Um, AI and, 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 and the fear mongering uh, because you know people's lives have been you know we've been able to increase financial inclusion because of using some machine learning using alternative data because you know people here did, don't have credit scores as like in other markets yes. so alternative data has been used you know to, to increase financial inclusion if we had started doing some of these laws we would never have been able to, to do that right and I mean to to investment I would say that you know, educate yourself about what AI is and actually how much capital it actually needs. Um, and because a lot of times when, when African startups go out there and say, hey, we actually need this amount of money because, you know, it, we, we don't have some of the infrastructure already, so we actually need to get this infrastructure to actually build this AI. Um, and so, uh, you know, we need some of that happening on the investor side and to see the opportunity because Again, the use cases for, for in, in Africa are really solving a lot of fundamental primary challenges in, in healthcare, in, in, in food security, in you know financial inclusion, in last mile deliveries, in you know EV uh, batteries, you know uh, you know so so transportation, um, agriculture. You know we're talking about commerce, uh, allowing more more efficient commerce. Recently, you know, we've been talking about the after like uh, program and like you know having, you know, how I, how why can't we translate into different languages within the continent, even documents for customs and things such as that, and so there's there's a lot of opportunity um, within the African continent, not not just looking at oh is someone making another image, um, you know, generation software that's what we want to invest in. I think really you know go for African. Uh, entrepreneurs who have lived experience in the problems that they're trying to solve as well, um, you know, and then the other s side is like looking at um, government, right? Government in terms of seeing the opportunity, you know, that we need to invest in. We actually need to be promoting uh, yes. a lot more of you know developers and you know even so if we are talking about even the misinformation side of things and the cybersecurity thing. That means actually we need to invest more in getting the talent that I can actually build tools. You know, Kenya was downgraded recently in terms of, you know, um, anti-money laundering. Yes. AI can be used in that to solve a lot of those things to be able, you know, AI is the one which is able to handle being able to pick anomalies in billions of trillions of transactions at a second. Right. You know, you, you can't even set up a team to be doing that. Like as, as individuals, you have to use some uh, machine intelligence to help with that. Right. Fraud cases of the committee guys who are calling you all the time. Right. You can use AI to be able to to analyze those calls like privately. Um, so really for government, it's like, how do we come up with a national AI strategy to actually become a green AI hub like of the world? Right. We have over 10,000 plus megawatts of, of geothermal potential, right? Yes. We have steam there, which can actually be able to be more efficiently used to cool some of these data centers, right, by conversion technologies, right? And so we can actually even become more, you know, water, um, uh, use water resources even for, for, for building AI more efficiently than most other um, countries. Then, you know, there's looking at as AI as public goods already today, if you look at it, the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner, you can engage in a chatbot which has been built by Kenyans. People, I think, people are Brian Omwenga, I think, they've, you know, doing botathons all around um, the country with, with young people, they're training talent. There's also, on the other side, at the BRS, Business Registration Services, they're also using a, a AI chatbot built from here. All of them can do Sheng and Swahili and English, built by talent here. And so when now we go to, to young people and developers, like, really think about the problems that are in context and always think locally but you know 
um, think locally, but you know when you're acting, think you know go globally, right? So the idea is like there's no reason why you know an AI company that's built here can't be a global AI company, you know, delivering a solution that's also going to be global because we we have very unique constraints that are here, which us innovating around those ones, the same way we innovated around, you know, uh, things such as mobile money, right? You know, these are some things now now that they are being replicated with like Cash App and other things, but we had this like, you know, 17, 20 years ago, right? Um, and I think if we have more of that of young people now getting training, and as Jensen said, let's use the AI, let's use use Copilot, use ChatGPT, GPT, use Beyond, use Perplexity, use all these things, educate yourself, let it be the modern packages, learn about how to use data, um, you know, to extract value uh, from data for this young, young and middle-aged and old, right? You know, that old person who's, you know, using a- AI to send those videos of an older man saying wise words, you know, <laughs> that's image, image um, generation software being used there. So really use and learn and ha- how to apply it because if we don't have, so I think there's a famous um, futurist who, who said something that, you know, the illiterate of the 21st century wouldn't be those who can't learn, but those who can't unlearn and learn and unlearn and learn again. So that's what we need to become yeah, as man, people. This- yeah, is that his name? Uh, no, not it wasn't Diamant, Diamant oh. is, yeah, or someone else. Uh, I think it was Alan Toffler. Mm-hmm. Toffler, yeah, to- Toffler. Um, so yeah, so the thing is, we really need to embrace these tools and use them. Become, you know, even if you're not a coder, mm-hmm. use these platforms mm-hmm. to learn to, to to code as a as a copilot and, and code with it, and then be able to build something interesting and and something that solves a problem. Right. So that, that's what I'd say. You know, we need to embrace it; otherwise, um, we'll be left behind. Thank you very much. So, government should not stifle development of AI through regulating AI that we are not yet even building, but rather promote the building and the use of AI, and for for. Ordinary citizens use the AI applications and tools that are available and, and build that fluency in the use of the technology. And you also talked about investors learning and understanding what AI is, particularly as it could be applied in the African context. You know, you know the way India became the call center, you know, uh, side of the world. Oh, yes. The interesting thing with Kenya is that one, we have very good literacy. Yes. Um, levels of like you know English understanding like um, the world and even our our view of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, I think also by leveraging the AI tools by learning them really well, we can also still leverage on the outsourcing market mm-hmm. because the tools give us more productivity and efficiency. So if we become some of the best in the world, we can actually eventually even create more jobs, become even more digital literate by. Uh, using these tools and then the same way now India now has become a tech superpower mm-hmm. by using the fact that they were doing uh, BPO to train their talent we can now train our talent using AI and actually now start building our own things mm-hmm. using AI while still creating employment for our, our young people because that's what we, we have a lot of young people mm-hmm. and then at the same time you know when when the president was talking about the Brian in uh, no. <laughs> in the Brian in Mashinani working for a uh, German AI company, right? Yeah. So if, if we if we build that talent by doing also work that is available and becoming really good at leveraging AI to even be more productive, we can become now the most productive talent in the world mm-hmm. because of re- leveraging AI. And then that builds our skills and digital skills with working with AI. Mm-hmm. And then now we can actually start building our own um, organizations and sending, you know, probes to the moon at the cheapest price. <laughs> yes, yes. Right? And, and that's what we can also leverage. Interesting. Thank you, Mutembe, for your time. We really appreciate um, you coming here and spending uh, your precious time with us. This has been very educational for me personally, and I trust that it will also be educational for our viewers. So all the best as you build Fastaga. Thank you. And uh, hope that you do get the investments that you're you're looking for. Thank Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much.